And you know, just arriving here in the Zoom room, being aware, you know, what you are bringing with you into the room. Checking in with the body, emotions, heart, and mind. Just putting it all down gently and contributing in a, through your full presence to this session. Lovely day, rainy day, but where I am here in San Rafael and I think in San Francisco is also some rain. Just slowing down. Times are urgent, we need to slow down. Okay, Tia, maybe a good time now to screen share in. And Tia, if you can unmute yourself, so I have one person, you know, to do call and response with me, if you don't mind. So we do the Namotasa, we can do that all together as a group. Oh. But, you, you know, and, and Tia, you just unmute yourself and everybody else please stays, stays muted. Otherwise, it's a cacophony. So let's do start with the Namotasa together, and then we do the refugees call and response, and then the precepts also in that way. Nam. I just have to change the sound. Sorry. Okay. Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Samputasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma samputasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma samputasa. And what I forgot to say is <coughs> only if you feel comfortable, of course, you know, the refugees in precepts. <coughs> if you've never done that before, just Observe and maybe another time. Buddham Sarananga Chami Buddham Sarananga Chami Tamang Sarananga Chami Tamang Sarananga Chami Sankang Sarananga Chami Sangham Saranam Gachami Tutiampi Putang Saranam Gachami Tutiampi Putang Saranam Gachami Tutiampi Tamang Saranam Gachami Tutiampi Tamang Saranam Gachami Tutiampi Sankang Sarananga Chami Tutiampi Sangam Sarananga Chami Tatiampi Putang Sarananga Chami Tatiampi Putang Sarananga Chami Tatiampi Tamang Sarananga Chami Atiyampi Dhammam Saranam Gachami 
Tatiampi Sankang Saranangachami. Tatiampi Sankang Saranangachami. Now please scroll up. And now I am going to say the precept in English and then afterwards you can repeat as a group. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from force and harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. Imani pancha sikha patani silena sukatinyanti silena boka sampada silena niputinyanti tasma silangvisotaye. Thank you. So you can bring us back to the screen. And you know, at the end, that was a blessing, kind of. You know, commending those who have taken the precept on giving that gift of fearlessness to the world by, you know, making an effort to train according to those guidelines. And it's not about being perfect, but it's about noticing, you know, when we are coming to the edge of those guidelines and then, you know, looking into the mind and then to the heart and seeing what's what is triggered, you know, and just noticing that we do have a choice. And if we notice it too late, then we can always start again. It's not about, you know, sinning or any, anything of that nature. It's just about, uh, you know, protecting ourselves and protecting others at the same time. You know, in this day and age where there's so much strife going on out there, you know, in the world, all over the place. And uh, I'm sure you've all seen and heard in the media what's going on in the Middle East, those really, really striking images of, uh, you know, how crazy it can become if the mind is not capable, you know, of uh, stepping back and observing what is going on. And is just kind of constantly reacting and acting out without any capacity for observation. So, you know, what's going on in the Gaza Strip and in the West Bank and in that part of the world is really a very intense example of the repetition compulsion of trauma and how you know, how out of hand it can, can get and getting passed down, you know, over generations and, and being very deep in embedded, you know, ancestral collective trauma where, you know, it's just like so overwhelming. It's such a wounded, you know, area and so hard, you know, to start any conversations about it without it blowing up left and right. So, you know, I wanted to speak today about uh, the Brahma Viharas, in particular about like Metta and Karuna, loving kindness and compassion. Last time, you know, I started us off on a series on what's called the four protective meditations and spoke about the meditation on the elements or the you know, the true nature of the body, that's one of them. And then last time we spoke about um, Buddhanusati, which is contemplation of the qualities of the mind of the Buddha and the life of the Buddha as a, you know, as a, as a role model for us who have the same potential because we also are human beings just like he was. 
<coughs> and originally the next next one in in the list would be the meditation on death but because of what's going on in the middle east i i exchanged it and speaking today about the brahma viharas and speak about death next time next month so and so how can we really you know stay in relationship to what we are experiencing when we are you know turning on the media when we see some of the images you know of children being buried under rubble and mothers you know being completely out of their minds and fathers and seeing you know the trauma getting completely out of hand and no, you know, from our own experience, when we are triggered, that this also can happen, you know, when we are triggered in some way, somebody says something or looks at us in a certain way, you know, or makes a comment or a tone of voice and bang, you know, something deep can be triggered. And then suddenly the whole landscape of the mind, you know, has a very different mood, a mood of sadness or a mood of, you know, feeling hopeless, helpless. So even, you know, us here in this very privileged situation, we can be triggered with a small thing. You know, I, I remember yesterday it happened to me again. You know, I spoke with some friends in, in, in Austria, I had a Zoom conversation, you know, and, and my life at this point in time is quite busy. You know, I'm doing quite a lot of teaching and also doing lots of trainings and my friends, they were very quiet and very relaxed, and I was the I'm the nun, you know, and I was like kind of busy and and then how they were speaking about it, I felt judged, you know. I, I don't know if they had judged me or not, but I definitely felt judged, you know, and then after the conversation my mind went back to it again and again, you know, thinking, Oh, I should have I shouldn't have, you know, and all of those things and about my image, you know, as a nun, and, and what will they think of me, and yeah, and just such a tiny thing, you know, which is really not having any repercussions for my life, you know, but such, even such a small thing, you know, had a significant impact on the mood of the mind that afternoon, you know, so it's really, really important that we learn to stay in relationship to what we feel and sense when we are triggered, but not kind of getting roped into it, you know, not losing ourselves in it. That's really a very important task, you know, in the practice. And then through doing that, you know, through really staying related to what is happening, but not identified, we start to get to know our patterns very well. And we also see conditionality in action you know how like a tone of voice a little thing or a big thing can can bring up you know a whole huge trauma bubble you know which we hadn't been able to transform yet because we hadn't had the resources we didn't have the understanding we weren't ready for it and then you know, it gets triggered and, and we regress and suddenly, you know, we feel like a little girl or a little boy and can be very confusing and, and quite painful and disorienting, you know. And then there's generally like a tendency, you know, that we want to not, we want to get away from it, you know, and then we just try to distract ourselves from it and there are so many ways how that can be done, you know. And the precepts are actually a very good protection to not lose ourselves too, too extreme, you know, in these ways of distracting, not getting drunk, you know, not taking drugs, not kind of in anger, you know, like acting out, uh, not taking something which is not given. So all of those things, they are just protections for the mind so that, and for action as well, you know, so that we can really take an opportunity of, you know, staying in relationship to what we are experiencing and, and allowing it to slowly transform through awareness and through the willingness, you know, to be directly connected with the experience. So, for example, you know, when that happened yesterday to me, 
that I felt judged by my friend, that I wasn't like the perfect peaceful nun, you know. <sighs> you know, then I had to just, there were all of those things going on in the mind, you know, and then I would just like, would just, just come here, you know, to the heart and feeling, they yeah, are feeling scared, you know, of, of not being respected, of not being appreciated. Maybe they're going to laugh about me, you know, feeling sh some kind of shame, feeling, you know, that little girl being shamed by the parent for doing something not good, you know. And then when I was a little girl, it was like very dangerous for me to be, you know, expelled basically from the circle of care in the family. So, you know, I couldn't really allow myself to stay open to that feeling. It, it felt dangerous, you know. So the system learned to shut down, to numb myself to that so that I could, you know, behave in the expected way so that I would be taken care of. and. So children, you know, have a tendency to always blame themselves. If something is not quite right, you know, they blame. They, they never think, oh, maybe the parent has unex, you know, has unreasonable expectations of a small child. Maybe they shouldn't be, you know, maybe they shouldn't be expected. A child would never think like that. Always blames itself and. When it gets too intense, just numbs out, shutting down, dissociating, uh, freezing. And that exactly, you know, is happening in so many ways when we are faced with just huge, huge things like the crisis in the Middle East or the climate crisis. You know, the, the system is just shutting down. And then it's really important to stay conscious of that shutting down, not blaming ourselves for it. It's not a dysfunction, but the shutting down, the numbing is a function, a function which protects us actually from overwhelm. But now, you know, because we are not children any longer, we can actually carefully, gently, slowly, you know, draw closer to the numbness and befriend it, you know, gently embracing it with loving kindness and compassion, melting that frozen protection response, you know, which is an evolutionary skill, you know, which we have learned. And it, it, it works really, but if it's repeated again and again and never really becomes conscious, then we are stagnating, you know, we are just staying on the spot and there is no development because we can't, we're just constantly, you know, in that spaced out dissociated numb state and then once you know we can actually recognize that oh you know I have shut down that's fine there's no need you know to push ourselves but it's so important to know So important to take an interest, to have a relationship to how we react. You know, if we are in a, in a, in a way are capable to respond or if we are caught up in a reaction. That's important. Not judging it, but just knowing it. You know, in particular with such huge cultural phenomena as what's going on in the Middle East or even huger than that, the climate crisis, you know, the collective checking out, the collective dissociation, the collective shutting down. 
because of the, the vast, the hugeness of the situation is overwhelming. But then, you know, if we learn some skills, we can slowly but surely, you know, draw closer. That's called tight trading. You know, to just take one bite. Don't, don't bite more often you can chew. But stay, you know, stay curious, stay in relationship. Don't turn away from it. That's so important. And that's why you know, we need to start with ourselves first. You know, having some compassion, some loving kindness for our own shutting down, for our own numbing, for our own overwhelm, for our own fear. Being able to stay conscious and hold it with kindness and compassion, that is where it all starts. And if there's some judgment going on, holding that as well in compassion. That's also like part of the pattern, you know. It's okay. Just seeing it, seeing what's happening and not running away from it. Like a little child, you know, just being there for that child, our own inner child. And then, you know, we can start by that very fact, you know, of turning towards our own experience with kindness like you know we are turning towards a child we can learn to learn from our experience we can learn to learn from our reactivity from our numbness from the overwhelm we can learn to learn from that you know getting to know ourselves better and through that knowing others because we are all human beings we have a lot in common and that's really you know what the brahma viharas are based on that commonality of all of us you know we all want to be loved we all want to be happy we all don't want to suffer and we all suffer as long as we are not fully awakened, there will be some kind of attachment, there will be some kind of suffering. That's the way it is. And from that understanding, you know, wisdom and compassion arise. By really understanding what it is, you know, to be a human being with these vulnerable bodies and vulnerable minds and you know in, in a practice like this showing care for that predicament you know we are all in together And then how easy it is, you know, to, to lash out, to have a sense of aversion if there is something happening which we don't like. <clears throat> how easy it is, even a small thing, you know. Live alone if, if you are bombarded, you know, squeezed into a very small area, 2.4 million people in an open air prison since so many years, you know, without any perspective for the future, so much difficulty and, you know, the, the long, long history of this area being constantly fought over, being the holy land of three different 
populations you know all have have historical links and the population has exploded over the centuries and it's getting more and more difficult to find a way to meet the needs of everybody then you know so many other nations getting involved and making it worse favoring you know one side over the other and making a mess So really allowing all of that to become conscious. And how important it is, you know, to have a handle on one's emotional experience and not lose ourselves in aversion against discomfort but making space for discomfort emotional and physical knowing that this is a real empowerment is a capacity which we need you know in order to tackle what is upon us you know with the climate crisis as well to make space for discomfort, not being so dependent on comfort. That's a real weakness. And this is when all of the populations who have been marginalized over the centuries, you know, how they have developed great resilience, being able to withstand and work with all of the injustices. that is something you know which the so-called you know privileged people never had to do very much or much less that can become a real weakness now So you know, just seeing all of the incredible messiness of it all. Just simply, you know, because of greed, hatred and delusion. It's not that anybody is bad. It's just not understanding the way things are, not understanding how it works. not really understanding that we are all interconnected we can't be happy and peaceful independently from everything else it's not really possible there are moments but it's not really possible to extract ourselves from all of this until we have done the work There's this beautiful image, you know, of the Buddha in the night of his awakening under the Bodhi tree in Bodhgaya. He was touching the earth and he was asking the earth, you know, to be his witness that he has done the work, that he is ready, you know, for breaking through. He isn't bypassing, but he has done it. He has done everything he needed to do it now. 
he can put it down. So you know the work here on earth is whatever is happening is our work. That we stay in relationship to that and do our part, whatever that's going to be for us. So we can just now, you know, enter the meditation more fully by, you know, bringing up an image in your heart, in your mind, you know, some media image you might have seen of a child or a parent or an old person, you know, in, in that area. You know, either you know in despair or really completely checked out in shock. You know, and holding that image with a lot of kindness and compassion in the heart. And uh, you know, the traditional sentence for uh, compassion is, may all beings be free from harm and the intention to harm. <clears throat> so on the one hand, you know, the victims, may they be free from harm and the perpetrators and the intention to harm. You know, who may be caught in a century long feud, you know, which has been passed down to them from their parents and grandparents, and there hasn't been much chance, you know, to reflect on that. Because of the intensity of the daily grind. May all beings be free from harm and the intention to harm. And seeing, you know, that the perpetrators and the victims, they are both caught And seeing you know, how the heart responds, if you allow this image to be there, you know, sensing into that. May all beings be free from harm and the intention to harm. I'm just giving it the space it needs, you know, like a medicinal bath, you know, for this mind and heart. It's just, you know, creating together, creating a little bit more inner space to witness the, that situation and how it affects us and 
how it affects others. And how, you know, that all belongs together. And also noticing, you know, how much easier it is to do this together, even we are just a small group. But it's different, much easier to do it with others. This collective witnessing of those things, you know, which are difficult to bear. You know, it helps us to balance and to stay related. And then with the in-breath, we are just, you know, noticing how it feels, you know, there's maybe a sense of healing, you know, in that mind, which is imbued with uh, loving kindness and compassion. Just by, you know, repeating that sentence and having the intention, we can bring that forth because it's an innate quality of the mind, which can be called forth. And with the in-breath, you know, we can sense how that feels in the heart area. And with the out-breath, we're allowing it to spread out throughout the whole body. Without any pressure, just allowing it to be there as much as it can. Including ourselves also in the circle of compassion and loving kindness.
may all beings be free from harm and their intention to harm. And you know, noticing how it slowly grows, you know, the energy of compassion in the body and in the mind. And you're with the out breath, allowing it to radiate out, you know, all around the body, above and below without any pressure, but just whatever is possible. By relaxing with the out breath into the space, which doesn't end at the walls of the room. And if the mind wanders off, you know, thinking about something else, as soon as you notice it, you know, gently bring it back, maybe to the image again, or simply you know, to the body and the spaciousness, whatever works for you. And just staying with that now for this time. May all beings be free from harm and the intention to harm. And there's this very well-known you know, verse in the Tamapada, the Tamapada number five, hatred never ceases by hatred. Only by love, hatred ceases. This is the eternal law. And another translation is, in this world, hate never yet dispelled hate. Only love dispels hate. This is the law, ancient and inexhaustible. And how hard that sometimes is, you know, to really live that if you're triggered, if you're afraid. to get identified with a, with a very long-standing feud. How difficult it is to stay conscious when the body and the mind are going crazy. And how important it is, you know, to take responsibility for that as much as we can.
So I know with the in breath, tasting how that feels, compassion. And with the out breath, letting go into the spaciousness. So, you know, really familiarizing ourselves with that mind state. So when we are triggered, we know the difference. It's not about you know being relaxed all the time, that's impossible, but it's about noticing, you know, when we are on the verge of getting identified and losing ourselves in the contracted mind. So by knowing the difference between the contracted mind and the open mind, we can stay tuned because we notice it much quicker because the difference will be so stark, you know, that it wakes us up.
if you're noticing the stillness, you know, and the capacity to stay in relationship when the mind is open. Then you're becoming aware, you know, of the spaciousness. You know, more leaning into that spaciousness, which doesn't end at the walls of the room. And being aware of that which knows about the space, which is also limitless, the awareness or the knowing, which knows all about what is happening in the big picture without judging, just knowing.
You've been feeling a bit drowsy, then just, you know, maybe open your eyes, take a deep breath. And inviting another like blessing into that space. Blessing, you know, from all the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas in these very dire situations. The Ukraine, the Middle East, the global climate crisis. There's so much inflamed material now. It is hard to stay connected. But we can stay connected with the innate quality of compassion and loving kindness in the heart, which can make space for everything. This is something we can do You know, empowering ourselves so that we can empower others. Then writing healing into the situation. And then, you know, slowly coming back to our bodies and feeling, sensing the weight of the body on the cushion on the chair, you know, gently being drawn towards the earth by the gravity. You know, the planet we are all on this together.
So in a few minutes, I'm gonna ring the bell. Slowly, you know, coming into the body, maybe opening their eyes slowly. And you know, noticing we are in a very small group today, and you know, we can stay conscious with this very difficult. Situation where there is a sense of hopelessness and helplessness aroused when we draw close. That's so great. So we are aroused. And still, we can bring some awareness to it, we can bring some spaciousness into that. intensity. So, you know, if there's anything anyone would like to comment or share, if there's nothing, there's no need to say anything. And I also wanted to, you know, share the benefits of the practice with Noam, who is one of the organizers at the San Francisco Dharma Collective and all, you know, all people in the collective, you know, who have friends and family involved in this area. No, I think his mother lives in Tel Aviv or, or somewhere in, you know, in um, Israel. And, and Tia said he's all of his brothers and cousins and so on, they got all drafted into the war. Their kids, because um, they're all older. Okay, their kids. But, but their kids are all like, Foster. there's the mandatory service and then there's um, uh, reserve service. So they've all, they're all, they're all still in reservist age and they're, they all got called up. Does anybody of you want to share something? I have a comment, I guess, and question. Yeah. Um, 
for about like the last month or so, I feel like I've kind of been in um a cycle of like overwhelm and then numbing. Um, and I recently started a new job a couple of months ago and it's been very difficult for me to feel like any sort of groundedness or, or try to, um, kind of feeling even like competent enough to like have a certain sense of like competence and, and calmness. And, um, and then it's, uh, when I get home, it's just like wanting to numb and, um, and then doing things that I know are not necessarily helpful for the long run, but feel like the, the things that I can do in the moment, which are not necessarily helpful for my mind or my body, (laughs) um, but includes, you know, like watching TV or not eating particularly healthy food, but something that's like quick and easy. And I just don't necessarily like in this like cycle that is, is occurring. It's like really hard. It's like, I know intellectually that it is not helpful, but like in the moment, it is so hard for me to break. And, um, yeah. And, and I guess it's just like a constant flow of like, for me, like information to take in during the day. Plus like, I don't even have like the capacity I feel like to take in anymore. Um, and so I just feel like kind of numb to many things emotionally and like relationships and that sort of thing. And I just don't quite know, like, at what point do I, can I break that cycle? So I don't know if you have any. Yeah. You know, I think, uh, you know, Alexis, just forget about this thing, breaking the cycle. So that's kind of a bit brutal, you know, like sledgehammer kind of aversion and so on, you know. I think that's why we did that practice today. You know, it's like more gently holding that, you know, that uh younger part of ourselves you know which wants to numb and which feels overwhelmed and the older part of ourselves you know that the adult what you can do is you can slow down you know you can slow down when you yeah at least when you get out of work you know you can slow down and you can take the time you know to to just be gentle with yourself and you know it's and it's sometimes it's okay to distract oneself you know but then if you find out you do it every evening when you come home every evening you do the same routine you know you eat junk food and you turn the tv on and whatever else you're doing if you do it every day then there is something you know which really needs some effort but if you just do it you know like say twice a week, you know, consciously, or even three times a week, you know, then that's different, you know, that that you just, you know, be really, uh, try to wean yourself off it, know it, but with kindness, you know, like a child, you know, like you, the, the older part of yourself, the awareness, you know, relating to that younger, scared, numb part of yourself, like, you know, like a, a parent, you know, like a parent, uh, like a mother to a child, when the child, like so the child is crying or is fearful, she's going to take it, you know, and hold it. And then she's still going to go about her day. She still needs to do the cooking and pick up the phone and do everything, but slower, you know, because she, she needs to have the child also with her. So you do everything, but you slow down and do less things, you know. And then you give yourself a few perks here and there because that's what you, you know, if you just started a new job and there's a lot of, you know, stress because of that. But do less, slow down and and have, you know, really have less screen time if you can because that's so draining, you know. Maybe read a book or something, you know, a really good book. I mean, there's really, you know, like a novel or something which takes you into some fantasy land or whatever you want, you know. But just 
you know, don't do so much screen and sit down with a book and, and something to eat, you know, and, and sometimes you eat junk food if that's, you know, what helps. I mean, I like sometimes junk food too, you know, but then if I eat it every day, it's not, it's not good, you know, and it's not the same perk anymore anyway, you know, because it becomes normal. So, you know, finding finding somehow a way that, that you that you relate to this younger part of yourself with in a way what we did you know when we did the meta meditation like it is truly a younger part of yourself which needs time and care you know to basically catch up you know and you can't break it don't even try, don't even use that word, you know, that's not the way, you're not going to break a child, you know, you have to help it to grow up, that's the only way. And the metta meditation, the, the Brahma Viharas are, you know, something like this, you know, where you hold it and then you just, you know, child throws a tantrum, you're not going to kind of beat it up on top of it, you give it the holding it needs to, to cool down, you know. Because it didn't have that, you know, when the trauma was, was, you know, stored away because we couldn't attend. There's this bubble of trauma energy, you know, which gets triggered then at times, you know, when there's big stress, when we change a job and when there is so much going on out there in the world. Yeah. So, you know, kind, 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 first to yourself. But it doesn't mean indulging, you know, like in a stupid way, but still in a kind way, because you cannot uh, go against the nature of how, how that's built, you know, our psyche, our bodies, this is a certain way and, and we can get to know how it works and then understand it by really drawing close, you know. And you're already aware of it, you know, so you are not completely lost in it, you know, you're not. So you're already on the right track. You know, just need to have more patience and, you know, times are urgent. We need to slow down. We need to slow down and go deeper. Otherwise, we're just going to be repeat, repeat the whole thing. You know, like what's happening in Israel and Gaza. I mean, that's just like a typical being caught in the loop of repetition compulsion of trauma. In a big way, you know, in a very big way. But you can see, you know, in a way that what happened to the Jewish people, you know, in, in the concentration camps, now they're going to pass that down, you know, in this huge open air concentration camp, which called Gaza Strip. You know, there's like, it's just a repeating and a repeating. Because there has been no, not enough skill, not enough of everything, you know, to, to stop and digest, to stop and digest this. But you can, you can do it, you know, because it's a small thing. And if things are not attended to when they are still small, they get bigger and bigger and then gets more and more difficult, you know. So do it now, don't wait, you know, and, and, and just, and sometimes you just, drop it and then you just indulge like as much as you like and then you see the next day how you feel you know is that really that great you know and then you somehow you feel like oh it's not it's actually not giving me what I want you know that's how you come off it but it's not but it's breaking the delusion rather than anything else you know not breaking yourself yeah Good luck, you know, Alexis. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure you can do it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That was very helpful. Thank you. Johnny, do you want to say something? Nope. And you, Tia? Um, I just want to say that today is the first time that I've heard the, um, the metaphrase include the, the intention to harm. So may I be beings be free from harm and the intention to harm and it really um 
I don't know. I feel like it's really going to be rich for me to think about the expansion of that, um, like for internal work and for the well-wishing for the world. So thank you for that. Thank you. You know, actually, I must admit that was actually the the phrase for compassion, you know, but I, I kind of put it together. But it's a, the, the classic sentence for meta is may all beings be happy and have the causes of happiness. And the compassion is may all beings be free from harm and the intention to harm. And then there's the mudita, you know, may all beings have, have, uh, I don't know what, what it is exactly, experience, yeah, I don't know how that classic one is. And then and the fourth one is, you know, all beings are the owners of their karma, they yeah, of their karma. And the one with mudita, but I have a note here, let me see what it is. Oh, may all beings enjoy good fortune. That's Mudita. May all beings enjoy good fortune. Yeah. Well, you know, that's what I wish you. May you all enjoy good fortune. Yeah. And, you know, I'm coming again next month, November, is the last one this year. And then we're gonna, as a last one, we're gonna reflect on death together, dying for 2023. <laughs> All right. Bye bye.